out there in internet land. My name is Bob Nystrom. I'm a Googler working on the Dart project. Uh, specifically, I spend most of my time hacking on Pub, which is our package manager. Uh, but when I'm not doing that, I spend a lot of time talking about Dart online and like mailing lists and Reddit and stuff like that. So when we let Dart into the wild last October, I mentally prepared myself for you know a wave of invective. I figured there are a few things people love more than complaining about new programming languages. I mean, there's a few things I love more than complaining about new programming languages. But I was just prepared for people saying Dart is bad technically. What made me a little sad, though, was people saying Dart was bad in, in the moral sense. Not just that it was a bad language, but that it was bad for the, the world, or at least the web, for it to exist. Like, like it was evil. In case you missed out, uh, here's my understanding of what people were saying. So, back in the early days of the web, during the browser wars of the 90s, Microsoft created this language called VBScript and put it in Internet Explorer. If you didn't want to write your client-side code in JavaScript, you could write it in VBScript instead. The rub, though, was that VBScript was only in Internet Explorer, and that basically broke the web in half. So instead of a single standards-based open web that all users can participate in equally, you had this part of the web using VBScript that only worked in IE, and then the rest of the web that worked in any browser. And that's, that's bad for users because it stifles competition. If any given website only works on a single browser, then browsers can't compete for that user's, user's attention. They're already locked in. So then Google comes along with our client-side web language, Dart, and we talk about having this nice native virtual machine for it that we want to put into Chrome. And, you know, this starts to sound like a familiar story. So people got kind of nervous and, you know, angry and started, you know, saying not very nice things about us. And, you know, that kind of made me wonder, like, was I evil? I mean, I, I don't feel evil, but I'm guessing that most villains don't, right? Like, maybe I'm on the dark side and I just don't realize it. So I started doing some soul searching. This is me and my dog. You can see I'm, I'm literally soul searching here. The, the dog is too, I guess. Could this be the image of some kind of evil villain? Well, I found a couple of problems. First, try as I might, I'm actually completely incapable of growing a goatee or any suitably sinister facial hair. Like, I, I can't even grow a mustache that I could twirl the ends of. Uh, also, every supervillain seems to have some sort of animal familiar to protect their evil lair. And I, I have one, but she's not like a vicious mutant half-shark, half-bear. She's a, a half-Yorkie, half-Pomeranian. Like, she's not going to protect my evil lair. But the most obvious reason I'm not an evil overlord is that I'm not an over anything. I, I have a boss. And, and then the realization hit me, like, what if my boss or his boss is the overlord? And, and what would that say about me? I would be a minion. And do minions know that they're minions? Now, I don't want to be a cog in some giant evil enterprise, so I spent a lot of time thinking about Dart. Of course, you know, technology itself has no morality. A split atom isn't good or evil. It's just a question of whether you use it in this or this. So the question I asked myself was, can Dart be a force for good? Can it be something that helps the world? I realize it, it looks like I'm joking here, but I really did this. Like, I care a lot about the integrity of my work, and I spend a lot of my free time hacking on open source stuff. And I do that in large part because I love the feeling that I'm making the world a better place. So that's kind of what this talk is about. Like, after my soul searching, this is the stuff that, that I found in Dart that makes me think that it isn't evil. Like, this is <clears throat> my story about how I think Dart could help make the open web better and why regular, like, non-evil web developers might want to consider using it. But before I talk about Dart, uh, let's talk about the web. For a long time, web developers got a free pass when it came to interactivity. The web was designed for this, physics papers and pages that link to physics papers, and, and that's pretty much it. So when web developers managed to get stuff like this working, this is Hotmail circa 1997, users were already impressed. I mean, sure, you had to refresh the whole page every time you wanted to delete a single email, but you could check your email from anywhere, right? Uh, well, unfortunately, bad news. Mobile devices are here. So web apps used to be awesome simply because you could get to your data wherever you were, and users were willing to give up all sorts of user experience niceties to get that. But omnipresence is no longer a web exclusive. Mobile apps are everywhere too, and they connect to the cloud. So anyone who has a smartphone can check their email anywhere, and they can do it in some native app that has like smooth animation and acceleration, multi-touch, 
offline support, like cute little sounds and stuff, and they never ever have to refresh the page. And that means users' expectations have risen. So great web apps these days have to be great apps and not just great web apps. Like we don't get to play the web card anymore. And that means no page refreshes. That means offline. That means animation and acceleration. And all of that means more code that's running on the browser. A lot more. Now, it wasn't that long ago that like 100 lines of JavaScript was like a lot of code. And a few years ago, the idea of having the MVC side of your app all running in the browser would have been like somewhere between like crazy and revolutionary. But now, you know, if you look, it seems like there's a new JavaScript MVC package, you know, coming out every single day. Now, I like JavaScript, but what I've found is that the bigger my apps get, the less I feel like JavaScript is a good fit. It scales surprisingly well, but what that means is that a language that was designed for about a dozen lines of code works pretty well up to, say, a few thousand. Um, but for comparison, Ember.js has 20,000 lines of code right now, and that's just the framework. And at that scale, I struggle with the language. Like, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with JavaScript. It just means that Brent and I probably didn't have anything like Google Maps in mind when he was designing it. And we're starting to write not just a lot of client-side code now, but really diverse client-side code. And the web has reached a level of maturity where no one language can meet everyone's needs. And we've been that way on the server side forever, but now the browser is like that too. The question is, how do you bring new languages to the browser in a way that doesn't break the web? Like, how do you make a new language without being evil? And the answer is the same answer that CoffeeScript and ClojureScript and others have. You compile to JavaScript. So there's a couple different ways to run dark code. We have a native virtual machine that executes dark code directly, sort of like you would Python or Ruby. And you can use that for server-side coding. And we hope to eventually put it in Chrome and any other browser that wants it. We've also got something we call Dartium, which is a, a custom build of Chromium, the open source version of Chrome, with that native Dart VM embedded in it. And that's really handy during development because it means you can iterate on your Dart code without a compile step. You just refresh the page like you would with JavaScript. And it means you can use the Chrome debugger and debug and step through the original Dart code and not like, you know, unreadable generated code. But completely separate from those, but just as important, we have something called Dart to JS. And this is an offline compiler that takes in an entire Dart program and compiles the whole thing to JavaScript. So with Dart to JS, you write all your code in Dart and then compile it to JavaScript, and then you just deploy that like you would a normal JS app. As long as your user's browser can run relatively modern JavaScript, they can run your app. Like, they don't care or even know that it was originally developed in Dart. What this means is that, yeah, Dart works in Chrome, but right now, today, it also works equally well in Firefox, Safari, and Internet Explorer. Like, you can run Dart on your iPad or your Android phone. Um, Opera will be up here at some point, uh, but we've got some bugs to fix. So the, the goal here is that any browser that supports modern, standards-compliant JavaScript will support Dart too. There's one last technical bit that I should mention before I start talking about the language itself. Uh, the Dart project is fully open sourced. It's uh, BSD licensed if you care about particular licenses. We work live in the public repository. Our bug tracker is public. Our mailing list are public. Pretty much everything. If you watch how we work it, we're kind of closer to being outside of Google than inside of it. Dart was designed by the same people who created uh, V8, which is the JavaScript engine in Chrome. And the fact that V8 is open source is what let Ryan Dahl build Node.js using it. So open source is, is pretty deeply ingrained in the team's culture. OK, now the fun stuff. Now I can start talking about the language. Um, I'm going to do a, a pretty quick overview. Since you know I don't really know who's going to be watching this or what the audience is, it's hard to go into details because Stuff that would be interesting to some people is going to be really boring to other people. Um, and the other reason I'll go pretty quickly at first is because Dart tries really hard to be familiar to anyone coming from like a Java or JavaScript background. So here's a simple Dart program. It looks kind of like C and JavaScript had a baby. Um, Dart inherits the same expressions and statements that you know from like C, C++, Java, C Sharp, JavaScript. You know, you have your familiar arithmetic operators, you've got if then else, while loops, for loops, you know, all that kind of basic stuff that you take for granted. Function declarations like main look like they do in C, and uh, main is the entry point of your app. <clears throat> but local variables are declared using var, kind of like JavaScript. Um, and also we've got nice list literals. 
We have map literals too, which means that uh, JSON is also a valid Dart syntax. Uh, there's a couple of other niceties going on here, on here too. We have a nice for in loop that will let you walk over any iterable collection. Uh, here you can see we have string interpolation. The, the little dollar sign curly block encloses an expression, and Dart will evaluate that and insert the result in the string for you. If you like a more functional style, this example could be this. Um, Dart, of course, has closures and nested functions like most newer languages do. Um, also, our built-in collection classes have most of the functional methods you expect, like for each and map and filter. The little arrow here is our syntax for lambdas, which is just an anonymous function whose body just returns the result of a single expression. Um, in fact, you can use that arrow syntax even for named functions like main if its body is just a single expression. So if you really want to go down the functional rabbit hole, this example could look like this. So basically, Dart is like your kind of vanilla curly brace and semicolon imperative language, and then we like poured a little functional chocolate sauce on top. For people like me that care about this kind of stuff, uh, Dart has solid lexical scoping. Variables are block scoped, not function scoped. There's no weird hoisting shenanigans. Um, also, closures and loops do the right thing. If you close over a loop variable, you'll get a fresh one each iteration. Um, but that's, that's kind of microscale stuff, though. Um, so let's go a bit bigger, and let's talk about classes. So when programs get big, one way we knock them down to size is by breaking them down into data types. You encapsulate your code in like kinds of things. Um, and doing this was a design pattern in languages like C, and then became part of the language in Simula, Smalltalk, and then Java, Self, JavaScript, you know, you name it. So most of these languages defined kinds of objects using classes. JavaScript is a bit unusual in that it inherited a different model called prototypes from a language called Self. Um, now prototypes are very cool and they're very flexible, but they're flexible in the way that assembly language is flexible, right? Like they let you do anything, but they kind of force you to do everything yourself. So for example, let's say you want to define a kind of monster object in JavaScript. Here's kind of the vanilla way of doing it. If you aren't fairly experienced in JavaScript, this is probably pretty opaque, so uh, I'll annotate it. And this, this code has a couple of problems with it. First, it's just it's really verbose and repetitive, right? Like we're mentioning monster six times, um, game object shows up three times, that's the thing that we're inheriting from. Then there's all this prototype machinery directly exposed. So the intent of this code is to define a kind of entity in our game, but what the code actually does is just muck around with JavaScript's dispatch mechanics. Now, there is a pattern here, and if you know the pattern, you can kind of like squint through it and see what's going on. But if you don't, this is just like semantic mystery meat, right? The last issue, and possibly the biggest, is that this is all imperative code. Like, we aren't declaring a type here. We're molding it out of unformed clay, one mutation at a time. And doing that's ugly, but worse, it's opaque to tools. So here's how you define the same class in Dart. Now, the obvious difference is that this is a lot shorter and simpler. We now have a built-in syntax to say, I am creating a type. So Dart lets you directly express your intent in the code instead of requiring you to know some pattern. But once we have a class syntax in the grammar, we can hang some other nice features off it. So because the compiler knows that we're inside a class definition, it can let us use super to call a super class constructor a method, so we don't have to keep saying game object over and over again. We've got this nice little syntactic sugar here to directly initialize a field from a constructor argument. Now, over in the JavaScript code, Every field access was preceded by this dot. It's always this dot name and not just name. And in the Dart code, that's gone. Since we have solid lexical scope and we can syntactically tell that we're in a class and what fields that class has, the compiler can figure out that a variable like name or attack refers to a field the same way you can in Java or C++. Okay, I'll go over one more like really nasty JavaScript pitfall that having a class syntax lets us fix but it's a bit tricky to explain, so I'll need another example. Okay, here's some JavaScript code. We're creating a monster object, and it has this method, make yell function, and that method returns a function. And when you call the function that it returns, it prints the monster's name. And the important bit here is that this function is a closure. It's accessing something declared in an outer scope. In particular, it accesses this, which should be the monster object that the method is on. 
So then down here, we call that method to get the function. And then finally, we call the function. So the question is, what does this print? So if you run this in Node, it prints this. Uh, in a browser, it'll do something different. Um, so if you got the right answer here, uh, congratulations. That means you've like gone through the rite of passage of being burned by this, and, and you're like a, a real JavaScript programmer. The problem here is that in JavaScript, the special this variable is dynamically bound, not lexically bound. When you call a method in JavaScript, this is always just like whatever object to the, was to the left of the dot when you called it. So if you do your mom dot is so fat, then inside is so fat, this will be bound to your mom. So when we call yell here, there's no receiver at all. It's not something dot yell. So this defaults to the global object instead. And that's, that's window in the browser. Um, and if window you know, were to happen to have a name property, then this would print whatever that was. The fix, uh, in case you're curious, is usually something along these lines. You get this, and you capture it in a variable that, or self. And then your closure refers to that variable instead. Since variables are lexically scoped, this retains the right object, the monster. Now, ultimately, this boils down to the fact that JavaScript doesn't distinguish between functions and methods. But if we translate this to Dart, though, we don't have that problem. Since we have a dedicated syntax for classes, we also have a distinction between methods, like this one, and functions, like this one. So this is dynamically bound in methods, which is what you need for overriding to work, but it's lexically bound for functions, which is what you want for closures. So that means that in Dart, this program does the right thing and prints the monster's name. So having a, a class syntax lets us do some, you know, some kind of nice stuff, but this is all kind of like small potatoes, right? The, uh, the big like, uh, potato with this is that now our tools can be aware of the data types in our program. So with the declarative syntax, you can see what types a program defines just by parsing. You don't have to execute any code. And this is something that we, we take for granted in statically typed languages like Java, but this is like rocket science in a language like JavaScript. So I will ask you to remember the bit about class syntax being tool friendly because I'm going to get back to it later. Now I understand that classes are a turnoff for a lot of JavaScripters because Java left a bad taste in their mouth. Like in Java, everything has to be in a class and you get this kind of like kingdom of nouns phenomenon where like even a simple function or variable has to be ensconced in some like boilerplate class definition. So Dart doesn't roll that way. Like, up until now, the examples I've showed you were just like simple top-level functions, and you can define entire programs just using those. The way I look at it is like Dart has classes, but it doesn't have like mandatory enrollment. Okay, I want to talk about just a few more corners of the language um, that I think are united by a, a common theme. So I, I talk about Dart being designed for bigger programs, but apps don't start big, right? They start small and then they grow. And Dart has a few features that I think are really cool because they help there because they, they keep you from needing to do what I call future-proofing. Um, so let me explain here. Here's some Java code. So we have these get name and get attacks methods, and all they do is return the field. So why not just get rid of those and, and make those fields public instead? Well, the answer, of course, is that, you know, sure, they just return the field now, but but who knows, maybe a year down the road we'll need to do some calculation to determine a monster's name or its attacks. And when that happens, we'd have to get every place in our program where we're accessing those fields and replace it with a call to our new method. And if this change is in a library that's been released into the wild, that's a breaking API change. The reason it's a breaking change is that accessing a field and calling a getter method in Java have different syntax. You can't transparently go from a field to a method without having to touch every single call site. And since you might need to do that at some point, everyone in Java just like preemptively wraps every single field in a getter, like just in case. And that's what I mean by future proofing. It's code that you write today just in case you end up needing the flexibility in the future. And to me, that sucks, right? You're basically burning time writing code that has no value for you today. And one of the things I like about Dart is that you rarely have to do that. In Dart, that example can just be this. Name and attacks are just fields. So let's say we decide to not store the name and calculate it instead. In Dart, you can just change that to a getter method. And the important bit is that the syntax for calling that getter is 100% identical to accessing a field. 
So in this example, name just has a getter, so it's an immutable property. You can read it, but you can't modify it. To make it mutable, you can also define uh, setter methods. So here we've added a setter method too. So now you can assign to the name property, and it invokes that method with the assigned value. And again, the syntax between setting a field and calling a user-defined setter method is identical at the call site. Okay, there's one other bit of future proofing in this Java example. So we're taking a list for attacks instead of a built-in Java array. Oh, why? There's actually a couple of subtle reasons, but <clears throat> one of the big ones is that, again, it's because the syntax for using them is different. So if you go from one to the other, it breaks all the code that's using it. And again, Dart has you covered here. So Dart lets you define your own subscript operators, the, uh, the square bracket thing. So you can go from a built-in list to some user-defined collection and support the exact same API that the native list uses. OK, I won't go into the details here, um, but this is like a table of a bunch of language features. So you start off just using the stuff on the left, which, has, which all have built-in behavior. And then later, if you find you need to insert some abstraction in there, the features on the right lets you seamlessly roll that stuff in using like your own user-defined behavior without breaking any existing code. So the idea is that when you start writing your app, you just write simple code that does what you need today. And then when it grows, the language should be ready to grow with you. Now, I'm here blathering about language features, um, but one of the things that people keep asking me is like, why are you making a language at all when the platform is the problem? Um, and I, I think a lot of us agree that like the whole web stack you know, needs work. Um, and one of the things that's cool about being at Google is that Google has people working on pretty much every corner, but we have people doing HTML, JavaScript, CSS, the DOM, you know, new HTML5 APIs, you name it, right? But in particular, let's talk about the DOM. So here's my understanding of the genesis of the DOM API. You got a bunch of people, the browser vendors, who actively disliked each other, and you jammed them in a room together. And you told them they couldn't leave until they all agree on a single API. And then you say, like, see how much XML you can involve. Um, you know, the more the better. Oh, and uh, also, don't forget to make it programming language agnostic. So like any really cool language feature that you like a lot, yeah, you can't use that. You can only use like lowest common denominator stuff that like every possible language supports. So given that, like, you know, the DOM API didn't come out too bad, but that's, that's still a, a, a pretty awful set of preconditions to start from. So Dart is a web language, so of, of course it has full access to the DOM API. Dart isn't like Java applets or Flash or something where it just runs in a special little rectangle in your page. It's fully integrated with the browser. But since we are making a new language, and we have this Dart to JavaScript compiler for it, we have a fantastic opportunity. We can also clean up the DOM. So we've got a compiler that's taking Dart code and spitting out JavaScript, and we can use that same machinery to take calls to a new better DOM API and then turn them into calls to the old school JavaScript DOM. And that means we can ditch like, you know, two decades of like old patterns and historical cruft, and you know, we can stop pretending that HTML is a flavor of XML. And we can make an API that only tries to be great for one language and that fully uses all of the features that are particular to that language. So that's what we're doing. Um, we've still got lots of work to do, but I can show you a couple of examples. So let's, let's talk about querying. You've got your happy little tree of nodes in your document, and you want to find some. Here's how you can do it in the DOM. This is, uh, this is like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? So several years ago, John Resig, you know, went to the mountaintop and received this divine revelation that thou shalt query for elements using CSS selectors. So you know, we took that gospel to heart, um, and this is what we have in our DOM API. If you want one element, you call query, and if you want them all, you call query all. These are both simple top-level functions. You just call them. There's no like document dot or anything. So query all returns a collection of elements. Uh, what kind of collection? And the original DOM API had to be language agnostic, and that meant that it couldn't rely on any collection types that were built into a particular language. So instead, it had to define its own weird DOM-specific, like slightly incompatible ones. So when you get a list of elements from the DOM in JavaScript, it isn't a normal JavaScript array, and you know, it might not have all the methods that you expect. But Dart's DOM API is for Dart, so we don't have that problem. When you get a collection from the DOM, you get a full-featured collection that supports everything that a built-in list supports, because it is a list. So let's say you want to get all of the non-empty button labels on your page, 
In Dart, you can just do this. Since lists support map and filter, the DOM collections do too. For arcane reasons, the JavaScript DOM API hates constructors. So like, let's say you want to make a button. Um, here's how you would do it. it and that's, that's kind of nasty. Um, of course, in, in practice, you just use jQuery or inner HTML or something. Uh, but to me, that's kind of just routing around the problem. In Dart, you can do this. Um, so when you're trying to learn a new API and you have some type that you know you want an instance of, the natural thing to do is to try to construct it. So with Dart, we just make that work. Um, also, notice that there's no special like append child or insert adjacent HTML method here to add the button to the document. Instead, we're calling add, which is just the regular method on lists. So if you know how to add items to a list, you already know how to add elements to the DOM. Now, I won't claim that you know this is some kind of like magic pixie dust that's going to somehow make all of your apps awesome. Uh, but I do think that small improvements like these cut down the time you spend you know, chasing down stupid little bugs and typos. Um, and for me, when I'm less frustrated, I am more creative. OK, if you've heard anything about Dart, uh, you're probably wondering uh, when I'm going to talk about types. So let's do that now. So people who like statically typed or dynamically typed languages um, historically have kind of like a rocky relationship with each other. You know, people who like dynamic languages seem to look at static languages like Java as being like, you know, kind of like boring and like plain, sort of just no fun vanilla languages. Um, and then meanwhile, people into static languages like think dynamic languages are, are too unsafe and unreliable to use for like real production code. And that, you know, the people who use them are, you know, a little crazy or maybe, you know, a little bananas. Uh, so, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I look at those, what I find myself wanting is this. Uh, I should apologize for how bad that, that metaphor is. That's pretty terrible. Um, so anyway, our goal with Dart is to try to get some of what's great about dynamic and static languages and, and kind of blend them together. Now, in their heart of hearts, the guys who designed Dart are, are much closer to the dynamic side. So Dart is mostly a dynamic language. You know, they started with, with a purely dynamic language kind of in the small talk vein. But then what they did is they mixed in just a little bit of static typing to try to get some of the benefits of that. Um, but they wanted to do that without giving up the flexibility and the open-endedness of a dynamic language. So for example, here's a, a chunk of Dart code. Um, now the most important thing about types in Dart is that they're optional. In Dart, you never have to write a type annotation if you don't, if you don't want to. Um, you know, that's why I've been able to show a bunch of code samples without a hint of static typing. So this Dart code here is, is perfectly valid because under the hood, the language is dynamically typed and it doesn't need any static types to run. But you know, if you don't roll that way, like you can slather types all over your code and, and that's fine too. Like, you know, maybe it's you know C nostalgia or you get you know paid by the volume of code or something. Uh, in practice, people seem to do a, a mix kind of like this. You know, they, they write types at the API boundary, but they don't usually worry about them for you know, things like local variables or lambdas. So if you do that, if you uh, sprinkle a few types in your code, then Dart gives you some benefits in return. So this is jQuery's contains method. And you notice that most of the documentation is just describing the types that those parameters allow. Um, it, would be, it would be hard to use this method without those comments, right? Like, you know, would you have known that you couldn't pass a jQuery object to it? So doing this in documentation works, but programmers don't have the best reputation for maintaining docs, right? Like, so having types gives you a really light way of writing this kind of documentation. And we found that just by making it easier, like, people are, you know, a good bit more likely to actually do it. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the Dart editor now, which is a free open source kind of lightweight IDE we're working on. Okay, I will do the kind of the, the world's quickest demo of what types let us do in the editor. Um, so we'll start really simple. So like here we have a function that's you know supposed to draw some stuff onto a, a DOM element. Um, and aside from the fact that it doesn't do anything, this is valid Dart code. But let's say we want to make it clear like what kind of elements we allow. We're going to be drawing using the Canvas API, so we'll annotate it to only accept Canvas elements. And to do that, we just do this. So now anyone looking at this code can see what kinds of elements are, are kosher here. So already this is, like, this is useful for people reading the code. But since type annotations are part of the language grammar, 
the tool can see them too. Um, so when I was talking about classes earlier, I said having a declarative syntax for classes helps with tools. Um, the missing piece was having type annotations that mention those tools, those classes. So now that we've got both, uh, I can kind of show you what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and implement this function here. Okay, so, you know, maybe I'm easily impressed, but to me that that's pretty awesome, right? Like we have full autocomplete going on for the DOM API. Um, and that's, that's really helpful when you're trying to learn your way around a new library, especially a, a big one like the DOM. Um, and it's especially helpful with stuff like Canvas here, where you have methods that take a lot of arguments and it's, you know, it's easy to forget like what the order is or, you know, which ones are optional. The reason the editor can do this is because it knows what types are associated with variables and it knows what methods those types support. Um, and of course, if it knows what those types are, it also you know, knows where they are. So we can do this too. So we've got you know, go, to go to definition working. Um, now of course, once you've got types and like your tool can kind of understand them like this, uh, the next thing you want it to do is tell you when you're using them wrong. So we can do that, we can do that too. Um, let's go ahead and get something wrong. So we'll try setting the line width. Now I'm going to guess that it takes like a, a string so that I can specify CSS units. Now when I try that, as soon as I do, uh, I get a warning like immediately in the editor telling me I'm doing the wrong thing instead of having to you know spend like who knows how much time you know debugging this stuff at runtime in my browser. Um, now. I feel a little silly like making a big deal out of this because you know anyone coming from Visual Studio or Eclipse is like yeah you know this is kind of old news but this kind of error checking is is kind of a rarity in client-side web programming um, and what I think is particularly cool here is that we got this error checking without having to put a lot of effort in you know you'll notice that this entire program has exactly one single type annotation just that like that one little canvas element up here and that's enough for the editor to figure out what I'm trying to do and like let me know when I've got it wrong so I hate tracking down stupid bugs, so this is, you know, this is kind of like sunshine and rainbows for me. Okay. So for us, like those are pretty much the big things that we want to get out of types. We want like better API documentation. Um, we want code navigation so you can learn your way around a code base. Uh, we want autocomplete so that you can discover like what methods types support as you use them and kind of learn an API interactively in your editor. Um, we want some basic error checking so you can catch typos and type errors. And, uh, and that's, that's really the major stuff, like maybe some refactoring support. Oh, and there's one more thing that types let us do. Um, this is something that, that I think is, I personally think is really, really cool um, and could possibly be a big deal for the web. Uh, so I'm pretty new to web programming and as I was learning my way around, I looked at a bunch of sites for various JavaScript libraries, and I started noticing something that, that seemed a little odd to me. So this is jQuery's website, and the little arrow it's pointing to, it's telling me how big the library is. Um, like, you know, like, why do I care about this? Like, I don't remember any C++ libraries being like, hey, you know, we're only like 5K of code or whatever. Uh, this is MooTools, it's pointing to, to Compact. So here, I guess, like, being small is, you know, important enough to be part of its branding. This is Raphael, like here, you know, it mentions small in the text and it, you know, highlights the file size and it goes out of its way to tell you like how big it is after you gzip it. Uh, this is Bootstrap. Um, Bootstrap doesn't seem, seem to care. Uh, oh, unless you look under the fold. Uh, so, you know, here, that cares too. Um, now finally, the ultimate example of this is, uh, is Zepto. So with Zepto, like even the name is about how small it is. Like the whole goal of Zepto's existence is to be small. Their pitch is like, hey, you know all that cool stuff in jQuery? Uh, we took most of that out. And that's kind of like, that's it. Um, now, just to be clear, the designers of these libraries are doing exactly the right thing for the world they live in, right? Like they're, they're not crazy. Um, you know, if you look, Zepto calls out the problem right here. Every line of JavaScript in a library that you use has to get pushed down the wire to the user's browser. And unless you're really, really clever, every line you send down adds a, a tiny bit of delay before users can start using your app. So, you know, the bigger the libraries you use, the slower your app starts up. So minimizing library size is the only way to get fast startup. 
My background, uh, strangely enough, is, is video games. So this seemed totally crazy to me. Like, I, I certainly cared about code size because I was coming from C++, so I had like template expansion and like limited game RAM, and you know I had this pathological aversion to instruction cache misses. But you know I, I never thought like, well, can't use this library. It's got functions that I don't call, um, because you know eliminating eliminating dead code is the linker's job. Like, where's my linker for JavaScript? Well, part of the problem is that it's really really hard. So here's here's some JavaScripts to create a monster object with uh, an attack method. Um, now the question is, is that method ever called in our program or can we strip it out? Well obviously, if we see something like this, then like, yeah, it, you know, it's probably in use. But you could also do this, uh, or this. Um, so this calls the attack method, but only on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, I think only in certain locales. So in general, it's not possible to statically tell what code is reachable in JavaScript. Like everything is mutable, everything is imperative, and everything can be reached by name using strings constructed at runtime. And that kind of flexibility is super fun for metaprogramming, but it's the kiss of death when you want to do stuff that relies on static analysis. But dead code elimination isn't impossible. Like Lispers and small talkers have been doing this forever, um, you know, because they've apparently been doing everything forever. So Lispers call dead code elimination tree shaking. They think of their code as a tree. And the root of the tree is main. And then the branches are everything that main calls and then everything that those things call and so on, like all the way out to the leaves. And code in your program that doesn't get called is, is just dead wood. Now imagine grabbing the trunk and shaking it hard. All of the loose dead branches that aren't actually connected fall off. And what you're left with is just the live tree, just the stuff that you can reach from the root. So in Dart, doing this is pretty easy. We have a declarative syntax for classes, so we know what methods every type supports. We have type annotations, so it's pretty easy to tell what types of objects are stored in variables. And then we also have a declarative syntax for importing modules. And that's enough to get a decent picture of which code is in use and which isn't. So we have this Dart to JavaScript compiler, but it doesn't just turn your Dart code into JavaScript. It reads in your entire program, your app, and like every single library it uses and then it grabs your main function and shakes the hell out of it. And it only generates code for the stuff that's left, the code that's called. Now, our hope is that this means that code reuse will be much easier in Dart. Like, you can, you can just make libraries that do useful stuff, and like, you shouldn't have to agonize over, like, can I you know, add this function to my library, or will that make it too big and scare off users? And when you use a library, the compiler will shake out the stuff you don't call. The only code that gets pushed down the wire is the code that you need, and you only pay for what you use. Okay, so uh, you survived the fire hose of slides. Um, I pushed like a, a whole pile of stuff onto your mental stack, so I'll pop the important bits off. Uh, first of all, the JavaScript community has code reuse problems because download sizes like limit the size of libraries you can use. Um, and if we're lucky, tree shaking to eliminate dead code automatically will help solve that for Dart. Um, taking a dynamic language and then layer on, uh, layering on just some like really simple optional static typing can give you, you know, autocomplete, code navigation, error checking, you know, maybe refactoring support, like most of the stuff you expect from a fully static language without a lot of the restrictions of a mandatory type checker. Uh, you can make the DOM a lot more awesome if you just pick one language and uh, that language isn't XML. Um, language features like getters and setters and operator overloading that let you take built-in syntax and give it your own user-defined behavior are like super awesome because they save you from having to write a bunch of pointless like future-proofing boilerplate code when your app is starting out and then they give you flexibility when it grows over time. Having language support for classes makes it a lot easier for programmers to express their intent declaratively, um, gives you a bunch of nice little features, and then makes tooling way easier. And finally, compilation to JavaScript is awesome, right? Like, it lets us all have new languages on the client without breaking the open web, and it lets Dart work on every major modern browser, like right now, without any effort on the users or the browser vendors part. Um, so if I'm very lucky, uh, hopefully I've you know, piqued your interest in Dart. If you 
you know, want to learn a little bit more and try it out, um, I strongly encourage you to check out dartling.org. We've got, you know, examples and tutorials and documentation and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, you can download the SDK. It works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, you can also download the editor, which includes the SDK, and it also um, includes Dartium, which is our, you know, our custom browser with the Dart VM installed. Uh, if nothing else, I think it's really cool to try out Dartium and just write a little bit of Dart code because the experience of having like a new language running natively in a, a browser, it, it has kind of an interesting feel. Like even if you ultimately don't end up liking Dart, it's kind of cool seeing what it's like to have a brow like have a language that just runs directly in the browser and, and t can talk to the DOM that isn't JavaScript. Um, but anyway, so that's that's it. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs>